my video on. Hey, Bob. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. How are you? Are you at home? Yeah, I am home. And in the last two minutes, my uh, shipment from Lobo arrived. Perfect. Yes. Actually, it took some considerable effort to orchestrate that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take credit anywhere we can. Absolutely. Shamelessly. <laughs> Well, time. Let's see. let's turn your videos on so we can see you all. Mr. Matthews. Hey, Jim. <laughs> it's an old time reunion here. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a reunion of old timers. That's what I should have said, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that some duck gear I see, Jim? I don't go anywhere without it, you know. All right. When you got Martin. the Pac-12 champion and men and women's basketball and you know football rose bowl champion you know you gotta you gotta ride those because they don't happen very often <laughs> no. yeah, i i have the oracle who helps me out rick kelly keeps me posted on all I'm of the sure. recruiting coups by the football team absolutely i, I talked to mcneil today too he was babbling about it who knows what but yes yeah oh yeah it's a small world anymore i just hope they get to play i know it is interesting. Who's joining us from uh, an iPad? Must be somebody whose sound is still off. Yeah, unmuted, so. And I see Stan Johnson's on. He doesn't have his video on, though. Hi, Stan. All right, I'm getting there. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, it's a brave new world, isn't it? Yeah, we don't judge at all. <laughs> well, you guys, Our age, there's no judgment. <laughs> making me turn on my video, huh? Mm -hmm. I'll get there. Thanks for the orders today. I just got them processed to go together. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I always like Randy's background there. I wonder how uh, he always gets the vineyard in the background and well we could trade off i can put it on mine if i want but <laughs> i just uh, i just press the right button although i actually am sitting right at that spot so it looks absolutely gorgeous here today the you know the rain has kind of blew through here uh and it's clear the the vines are happy um yeah it's, it's life is good country living Jim, you look like a big game hunter. Well, I like to hunt games, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do a little bit of it. Uh, those two behind me actually came out of South Texas a few years ago. Wow. Uh, somewhere around the house, I got an elk hanging. And, you know, yeah, I grew up doing that, so it's kind of fun. Now I got grandsons that do it with me, so. What's the situation? How old are your grandsons? Uh, one graduated in Oregon, Jim. from Oregon this year. The other one's graduating from high school. The other one is a sophomore in high school. So they have to be strong because they have to pack Grandpa out of the bottom of the canyon first. Then they can pack out the rest. <laughs> Hi, Orcus. How are you doing? We're good. Hi, Jenny. How are you doing? Okay. Jenny's got a glass of Chardonnay in her hand. What do you have, Barbara? Uh, we have a eleven um, chardonnay, a shard, mm. shard. Oh, okay, mm, that's kind of a big deal. What's the vintage? Sixteen. Oh, oh, it's still good. I'm just Three. gonna pat it for a while. <laughs> now don't you? Yeah, you you don't have to stow them away. <laughs> no, they're like babies. <laughs> Unless your kids are coming. You know, yeah, no, that's what we really have to do. Yes. Um, you just have to get a little wine fridge that has a lock. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, for, you forget who they are. <laughs> so, Stan, are you set up now? Uh, no, I'm not. I, I'm having trouble getting the video. It tells me I have to quit and rejoin, and I don't want to do that. That's okay. You can. Well, we know you're on. We know you're on. Jenny, have you gotten your sound on? 
I can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, we can okay. hear you now. Yeah. This is a 2017 Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. 2016, 2017. Oh, we got some Chard lovers. Yes. And this is your 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon. Wow. Oh, so the, the Napa or the Atlas Peak? I bet it's the Napa. Yeah. Because yeah. we haven't released the Atlas Peak. <laughs> that would be a good reason. That would be a reason why. That, okay, yeah, I guess that's pretty good deduction. <laughs> this is a 2018 Chardonnay. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's probably too young, but it's very good. No, oh, it's, not, just, it's not too just young at all. Hey, that's, there's Ryan. That's Stephen Chris. Chris. Ryan. Can you hear me, Chris? Let's see, who am I, who am I hearing but not seeing? You are hearing Sue Linehart, but I do not oh. have my camera on. Okay, well that's okay. And I'm the one with the iPad. <laughs> oh, okay, that, that just tells me who it is. Oh. Yeah, it took me a minute to figure out the microphone. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> you're probably ahead of me. <laughs> How are you doing, Ryan? Good, good to see you. Ryan is our son, our oldest son. Joining, he likes to check us out and make sure we're staying on the straight and narrow here. <laughs> and there's Pam Peterson. Whoa, hey Pam. Have you got your audio on, Pam? Yeah, she's connecting. I can see she's connecting. So, so I just have to say, isn't it amazing that we produce such a handsome child? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I got to embarrass you. Sorry about that, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. I take after mom. Yeah. <laughs> you have it for that. <laughs> That's pretty good. Hey, Bob. You know, did you say you were drinking the sixteen Napa Valley Cab? Yep. Yes. Uh -huh. No, wait. The fifteen. Fifteen. Oh. Bob Matthews doing sixteen. A lot of shard lovers here today. So. Yeah, the 15, that's the one that hit the cover in Decanter. That's, that's, that's hard to come by, man. <laughs> you gotta, you got to know someone to get that wine. Well, I do. I'm very fortunate that way. <laughs> well, and you, you better really enjoy it today, too. You been, drink the whole bottle today. <laughs> <laughs> Before 5 o'clock. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's Remember, it's... Uh, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? That's right. It's six right. o'clock here. Okay. Sorry, Sam. My time. Pam, how are you doing? Do you have your audio on, Pam? Can you hear us? No. Okay. She's not hearing us yet. So but she's there, I see she's in her organ gear too. It must be cold down in Las Gatas. So what do we got? We've got California here. We've got Orcas Island. We've got also Washington. We've got, got Virginia. 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 Yeah. We've got Texas. We've got Texas. Texas, right? We've got Texas Dallas. Is having a heat wave. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> too way too hot. Well, um, at least somebody I guess should officially welcome all of you. So it's <laughs> time to start. It looks like the uh, three o'clock is our new five o'clock. I, I'm sorry to report that uh, our winemaker can't join us today. Uh, for, so for those of you that joined thinking, oh, I was going to talk to Victoria, oh crap, you can sign <laughs> off and we won't have our feelings hurt, but uh, she's actually on an important mission for us today. Um, she's finding the uh, 2018 cab. She's doing and, trials. She's not actually and, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, you have to have access to the lab and you only have certain windows of time when you can do it. Oops. And it just over, unfortunately overlaps. So she's doing finding trials. Uh, for, I don't know, for those of you that uh, aren't, into, oh, no. aren't into that part of the winemaking, <laughs> finding is a process that it's an elective process. You don't have to do it, but we frequently do it with our red wines and in particular our Cabernet Sauvignons. It's uh, it's a process. It's the goofiest process to watch. The first time I saw it, I thought, no, you're kidding me, man. Really, that's what you do? Uh, but she drops uh, egg whites into the barrel. Oh, you're getting noise, background noise, Randy. Oh, it's probably a breeze out here. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's hopping in the wind. How about now? Better. 
anyway, you drop uh, egg whites into the barrel and the albumin, the egg white, uh, binds to some of the tannins in the wine and smooths it out a little bit. And, uh, and then it, after it binds, it actually picks up heft and drops to the bottom of the barrel so that the next time you rack the barrels, racking is just the process of cleaning the barrels. Maybe two, three times in the life of the wine, you'll take the, the juice out of the barrel and you'll store it somewhere else and clean the barrel and then put the wine back in. Uh, so is it still blowing? Yep, still blowing. But we can hear you. We can still hear you. Oh, okay. So anyway, uh, finding trials are you get in the lab because you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to strip out too much tannin, but you want to strip out just the right amount. So it's a very carefully calibrated process by which you determine how much of the egg white you put in the barrels that produces the result that you want. Um, there, there are actually a few different animal proteins that you can use to... To, to find with, uh, you can use gelatin from bones, you can actually use casein from milk, uh, but they tend to be more like sledgehammers. <laughs> egg whites are much gentler, and so that's virtually the only way that we find, we find with egg whites. Uh, and, uh, and it really is remarkable, the difference that it produces in the wine, like I say, really smooths it right out. Um, you know, so you don't have too much of that cottony uh, finish with the wine, and, too much uh, astringency, uh, but you still have enough structure. It's not, uh, a lot of people confuse it with filtering, which is a different process where you basically are just uh, running the wine through sieves to uh, take out any tiny bits of sediment and so forth. So there, there are some winemakers who really brag about their wines being unfined and unfiltered. If you're really into wine, you, you're, you recognize that phrase. And uh, so for us, if it works out, fine. We're, we're okay with unfined and unfiltered. But it's no particular badge of honor to do every vintage that way. And some of the vintages, for sure, get better with fining. And some of them aren't appropriate uh, for filtering. But some of them you really need to or else you end up with a hazy wine. Anyway, that's a long-winded explanation for why Victoria isn't with us. Like I say, she's, she's doing something uh, also equally important, I'll just say that. Well, I'll, I'll add what she, I asked her to explain it to me in layman's terms, <laughs> what fining meant, and she sent me a really good analogy, which I think really explains it, and she said, it's like having a beautifully, a beautiful piece of rough wood that you're going to put down on your floor, and if you don't sand it, your feet are going to get splinters. So you sand it and make it smooth, you smooth it out before you put it on the floor so that you can walk on it or slide on it with your socks, whatever you decide to do. But that was kind of the layman's explanation for fining. And uh, she also sent me her most favorite. Her most favorite. Her most favorite wine. Her most favorite wine. Ooh, I'm getting an echo. It's the 2013 Atlas Peak Cab. Mm. Oh. Wow. That's wow. her favorite. That's really? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Write that down. What are you folks drinking? I know, I know Bob's drinking the 15 Napa Valley Cab, and that's, like I say, that's, that was the Gander Prize winner. So, uh, can't argue with that choice. But why'd you pick it? Um, no particular reason. It just, you know, just looking and thought, okay, give it a, sh give that one, uh, get that one out and, and, Enjoy it with everyone today. So. Did you see the article in Decanter? I know Jim saw it. Decanter, yeah. The December Decanter magazine had that particular vintage on the cover. Well, I can understand wow. why. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ryan, are you drinking anything? Or are you just watching us today? Well, I can't get started with this yet. I'm I'm still technically on the clock. I had a few more meetings <laughs> for my day in. But I did bring with me um, a, a Merlot, 2017 Merlot. Oh, the Merlot. Yeah, we, we talked about that last week. 
I know, and I missed that, so that's part of the reason. I also brought it to highlight because it's the last bottle of Lobo I have right now. So, so I will need to get some reinforcements soon. That's a subtle hint. <laughs> Come subtle on, Dad. <laughs> that, made your, that made your decision easier. Well, I'll send out to everyone, all of these Zoom meetings have been recorded and then Randy edits them and then we put them up on the U on our YouTube channel. So Lobo Wines on YouTube, you can find every one of these Wine Wednesdays that we've done if you want to watch the one from Merlot last week. Actually, uh, Chris came up with a good idea for people, that, uh, several people have said that they would like to be tasting the wine that we're focusing on, especially when the winemaker is with us. Mm -hmm. And so she's just, I think just yesterday, or you can tell me, but I think it was yesterday, she's put together a three pack, the next three wines that we're gonna focus on, she's put together a three pack uh, that if people order it in time, we can get it to you so that then you can open what we open. And especially, it's especially interesting because Victoria will be take, going through all of those wines and, and uh, doing the whole tasting experience in terms of the bouquet of the wine and the flavors and so forth. <clears throat> it's always fun to me to see if I pick up the same descriptors. She's uh, she's she's talking about stone fruit and boys and and cassis and I'm thinking, oh, it tastes like grape juice to me. <laughs> uh, uh, it's always interesting to me to see how the descriptors compare. She picks up things that, maybe it's the power of suggestion, but She'll say, oh, yeah, I'm getting a little bit of nutmeg on the finish, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I think that's getting it. Usually I've already drank it all, so I don't know what it tasted like. <laughs> 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 I'm drinking the 2018 Chardonnay, which is your focus next week, right? Right. We're going to do the so 20, I'm just keep, I'm gonna... 2018 Chard and the 2016 Howell. Right. The how I don't have, but the Chardonnay I've got. So it just took delivery of it. So I gotta I gotta save some of it for next Wednesday. Okay. Well I think that, that this three pack I just finished the plug, Chris is, has priced this three pack at twenty five percent off with free shipping. Right. Wow. That's a good deal. Yeah, so yeah, the idea is to just make it uh, at least more affordable so that people can uh, join in. Yeah. That's uh, the 16 Howl is actually with Chris Meyer drinking right now. We're still getting echo, Randy. I don't know why. But... So, Pam, what are you drinking? I have an Oregon Duck sweatshirt on. I know that, but what are you drinking? <laughs> I don't drink anything yet, but I did open up. No, I can hear the echo. That's all right. I'm moving. Uh, I did open up. I did open up. I did dread, but it's not uh, a Merlot, but it was a Mary Hill. Okay. And it was fun. It was We're going to have to send you home. You have to drink your Lobo, you know. <laughs> well, I, I just got four Lobos yesterday. Does somebody have a cell phone on? Because that's what's causing the echo. Thank you, dear. No, we don't have our. No, we don't have our. Oh, muted. We don't have ours muted. I don't have ours muted. Randy, yours is not Randy, muted. Yours is Ryan not thinks muted. one of us has our. Your computers are too close to each other. That's probably it. But he's outside, so I'm. I keep moving around. I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna try to move move around and see if I can pick. You. Well, I moved. I moved well, into I moved, another I room. I hope. Room. But that's not helping. That's not, no, that's not it. Nope, that's, that's not, not it. it. That's not it. Mm. Mm. So, nobody has a cell. Nobody has a cell. No. 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 Your cell phone's on. Well, I'll, let me see if I mute my audio. Maybe that'll help you, Randy. So, Ryan, maybe we should just drink the wine instead of chit chat. 
<laughs> well, I want to say that well, I think the, the 2017 chart and I'm going to have, have, have it with Halibut tonight. Uh, Wait, that's what we're having. That's what we're having. So I thought it was a lot of flavor up front and it's got a nice finish. Wow. I'm tasting vanilla. I'm tasting vanilla. If let's let's try if if everybody mutes themselves all all off to the left, there's a mute button. And then when one person speaks, they unmute themselves and may see if we can get rid of that echo. Good idea. You see what I'm talking about, Randy? That works. Yes, that works. Okay, that worked. So now over on the left, where it's if you muted yourself, you can just unmute it when you want to talk. So I'd like to hear more about the Chardonnay since I haven't had that for at least a week. <laughs> it's amazing how it works because we, we just have a closet. <laughs> We're drinking everything. We're drinking everything. There's my still. With Chardonnay, still. with Chardonnay, were you asking about 17 or 18 or do you? Either one. You're drinking both. So yeah, uh, uh, year one. And if you have an impression of the difference between the two, okay. it's not really. Um... I didn't hear that. That, that if, if I'm drinking the 18 Chardonnay. It's very good, very tasty. I don't know what all the proper words are. I've only been delivered this stuff for a week, so it's new to me. But it's quite tasty. Uh, I love it. I'm a, I'm a, before I was a longtime Kistler fan, but I think this is an able replacement and probably more affordable. But anyway, it's it just sort of salute. Maybe it'll be better a year from now, but right now I think it's very tasty. Over. Jenny? And I think that the 2017 is re ready to drink. I really do. It's tasting really good tonight. I hope you have some left when you have your halibut tonight. <laughs> you it's just me, and that's the one problem right now. We're, I'm in a um, continuing care community, and we're locked down. And so I hate to open up an, such a nice bottle of wine just for me, but I'm going to enjoy it. Well, then it'll refrigerate. And I'm curious what temperature you're drinking it at. Actually, I took it out of the refrigerator at, uh, about 30 minutes, ago, 40 minutes ago. So it's, it's still pretty cool, but it's not as cold as it was. Jenny, this is Sue in Texas, and I just want you to know, don't ever apologize for opening a bottle of good wine by yourself. Just <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. So, Sue, oh. are you drinking anything while you're on your iPad? No, I'm not right now. I have, I have plans for perhaps later we may when I get dinner around, but uh, not right, not at the moment. I'm interested in that Chardonnay, though. I'm not much of a Chardonnay person, but I, it would be nice to try the, the Lobo. It's Maybe I'll get an opportunity at some point. We have, it's interesting. Some people, I don't, I don't quite get this, but some people say they call it a cab lover Chardonnay. I, I assume they intend that to be a compliment. <laughs> that, that, uh, I assume what it refers to is the, the kind of the heft and texture of the wine. Uh, one of the things that I've always liked about that shard is that it's it has a very uh, viscous te texture in the mouth. It's, it's a very creamy, uh, and uh, especially if it's not too cold. It makes a huge difference to do what you did and take it out of the refrigerator a little while before you, before you drink it. That's the word I'd use. It's 
creamy right now. Yeah. I mean, the, the flavor profile goes from like this to like this, if you just let it warm up a little bit. I'm not saying up to room temperature necessarily, but uh, it's always been a pet peeve for both Chris and I when we go into restaurants and they bring you the Chardonnay, you know, just like it's a cold course and, uh, uh, you know, right out of the fridge. How's the Merlot, Ryan? <laughs> He's not drinking. I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> hasn't opened it. I see Marcy in the background too. Hi, Marcy. I'm hovering. <laughs> Have you tasted it? Oh. We tasted it a while ago, mm -hmm. and it was so amazing, right out of the bottle. And that was even maybe last fall when we had it for the first time. When did you release it, or when did you have it in bottles? Well, it's been. It was 2017, so probably we just did it about six months ago, put it in the bottle, six or seven months, and we're just now releasing it. I'm Marcy. excited about it. So it's, Marcy, on our, little... it's on the website, but it's under pre-releases. So you have to be a PAC member or an alpha member to get into that section. You have to log in in order to get it. But Marcy, get a little closer to the camera. This is one of our beautiful daughters-in-law. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm the, mother, the mother of two of our grandchildren. I know many of you, actually. A lot of you are, are familiar to me. It's good to see friendly faces again. You've probably seen them on, or seen their names on Facebook, too, on the Facebook yep. page. Marcy yep. is our social media guru. She keeps uh, everything posted when I send her stuff, so. I post for them, and they give me wine. It works out really nicely. Yep, and your husband just let us know you're low on Lobo wine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come for a visit. <laughs> okay, as soon as we can. So I don't know if the if all of you were on when we talked about the Merlot, but that's really an unusual uh, circumstance for us. That wine, it's a, it's it's sort of a it's a unique wine because it, we only made one vintage of it. We may, depending upon the response, I guess ramp up and make more, but that wasn't the plan. Uh, the the Merlot came about because. Uh, we had a fire, of course, up here on Atlas Peak in 2017, and the Merlot ripens faster than the Cabernet Sauvignon. So just by chance, the Merlot had ripened sufficiently that we picked it two or three days before the fire, but the Cabernet was still on the vines, and virtually all of it was destroyed. So then we were sitting with a bunch of Merlot and nothing to blend it with. Uh, the, uh, my initial thought was to sell it, there are lots of wineries that would have, would have bought the juice from us. But then when Chris and Victoria and I tasted it, we just thought, hell with that. This is too good. Let's just, let's make an exception and, and make a Merlot. So, I mean, it's 100% Merlot. And uh, it's, uh, anyway, it, uh, I think that right now, didn't you say that uh, only Alpha and PAC members can access it? Yeah, on the website in the pre-release section. You have to log in in order to get access to that section of the website. Yeah, we only did 40 cases of it, so it's it won't be around for long. But uh, it's tasting, Ryan, when, when you finally get a chance to crack that bottle, you'll be happy. It's, yeah, tasting, no. it's tasting good. Okay. And, and it's also a wine you could lay down easily for a couple of years. Yeah, it was really good. It must have been in the fall when we were we took it for a special event. We actually took it with us to a local uh, steakhouse, um, and I had it with a, you know, what normally I would have a, probably a cab with, and it held up just as fine. It was fantastic, both for my steak and for, um, you know, Marcy's non-steak dish. We were we were talking. I think when we discussed the Merlot about. The, the prejudices against Merlot, especially since the movie Sideways, which just, I mean, just pilloried Merlot. And uh, as the sort of the blah, kind of uh, flabby, monotonal wine of the masses. Um, but uh, so I was curious, and I, I'd always heard about Chateau Petrus uh, from Bordeaux, uh, a wine that uh, I, I had thought had some Merlot in it, and I started doing a little research and found out that it's actually 100% Merlot. It sells for something like $3,000 a bottle or something like that. So it is possible to make a Merlot that is a prized wine. Yeah, we talked about it last week, and what I had learned in studying it was that the name Merlot is 
actually comes from the French and it means little blackbird. And so. Um, Speaking of colors, we, we have had some, <laughs> the biggest decision after we decided to make the Merlot was what was the eye color going to be? We're kind of running out of eye colors. Yeah, I don't really think there's a green eyed wolf, but. Well, there I'm is now. Stickler about that, but. We'll call it hazel. Hazel, no. So how's your wine holding up, Bob? I am so pleased that I opened this bottle. <laughs> Good. That's what we like to hear. So yes, it's holding up quite well. And I just want to thank you and Chris for taking the time to set these up. It is, it is so pleasant. And it's pleasant to see, you know, faces of, of, of people that, that you've obviously, you know, been involved with, obviously your son, your daughter-in-law. That's great. So thank you very much. It's, I, I know it's a little tough sometimes, but this is really appreciated. Yeah. Well, it's all been on lockdown for so long, and some of us, I guess, are it's being extended even farther. I think I just heard L.A. was going to be on lockdown till July 4th. Try that one. Mm. Wow. You are correct. Yeah. And I don't know about Orange County, where I live. They submitted a plan to the governor, and they're waiting for it to be approved. So we'll see. Napa's opening up a little bit more, but they're still not giving us the green light for tastings or tours at the winery yet. But we are getting prepared. They've been doing staff training and they're figuring out uh, how we're going to do tastings. I think they're gonna be mostly outdoors um, in the front uh, with the chairs spaced six feet apart. And uh, that's what they're looking at right now. We'll see how it goes. We, we still have some construction going on there. so. Hopefully that'll finish up by July as well. So we're hopeful, but we've been very fortunate to uh, have everybody supporting us and, you know, still buying wine. I guess when you are <laughs> hunkered down somewhere, it does turn your thoughts to uh, having something good to drink with your meal or just a cocktail. I mean, I'm, I'm now experimenting with cocktails too, so uh, it's it's kind of fun, so. The, uh, the winery is actually progressing again. Uh, again, they, most of you know that we've been rebuilding our home and our guest house up on Atlas Peak. And, and Chris and I have been living in the guest house now for five months. Uh, it's uh, uh, the last five months of this two and a half year rebuilding process. And I think we're within sight uh, contractor at least said yesterday that at least someday in June he promises we'll get the keys to the main house but uh, just as it happens by coincidence uh, we've also been overseeing the construction project at the winery and I don't know um, there must be some of you at least that haven't been to the winery yet and uh, and if that's true definitely uh, want to show want to come if you've been before uh, you'll really get a kick out of seeing the changes and additions that have been made. Uh, we have basically finished off the second half of the underground facility. So now we have underground, we have almost a full, just shy of 20,000 square feet of space. Uh, we've added uh, some other vintners who are gonna be making wines in there to fill the, some of the space. But we've also put in a tasting room uh, that's really cool. I think it's really cool. It's got uh, one big arch. Uh, instead of being shot created, it leaves exposed all of the geologic layers of the stone that have been tunneled. So you can see the geology of the rock. Uh, and then we put in a, a caterer's kitchen and a banquet facility. And uh, perhaps from my point of view, most importantly, when we're all done with this, which we're projecting for like maybe 45 days from now, the county has promised that they'll issue us a permit that allows us to have tastings out on the back patio which is of course where the, the, the views are and uh, again for those of you that have been up there you know what I'm talking about the views are ridiculous uh, really just so pleasant so uh, we're excited about that too I, I'd say if you're planning to come to Napa and you want to visit the winery uh, anytime uh, after shelter in place gets lifted is fine but you're probably better off if it turns out that it's later in the summer rather than earlier. Um, 
the, the contractor for the winery assures me that we will be ready for, he assures me, I mean, he assures me <laughs> that we will be ready for a harvest. Uh, and if we aren't, that's going to be a real problem. But uh, And harvest for us starts you know, early to mid-August. Uh, we pick the rosé uh, much earlier than everything else so that we have the nice crisp acidity. So, you know, it's hard to believe, but it's mid March, mid May already, and we're going to be picking grapes in another couple of months. Which is another part of the lockdown problem because in, in opening up, we also have to have protocols in place for any of our vineyard workers uh, during harvest, which, as you know, people are sort of packed together, mm -hmm. same with bottling. So it's going to be a challenge to figure out how to do this. Did we lose Jim? Maybe it's just my screen. No, Jim's there. Oh, there he's he is. I got it. A little okay. darker. He's got it. He's got, he's got the horns in back of him. I, so I forget, forgive me, Jim. I missed it. What are you drinking again? I didn't tell you. I found yesterday a 2013 Pinot. Oh, my goodness. Oh so my. I didn't realize I still had one that old. That was the first Pinot that Victoria made for us. Yeah, so I had, we, we popped it last night, and I am finishing it now. Oh, sweet. So if you guys stay on long enough, I'll have to open another bottle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's music to your ears, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. That's funny. Well, I do remember somebody Didn't on you the call the 15? who left. Go ahead. Uh, didn't you say that the 15 Napa cab was a good cab? Well, that, 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 <laughs> good. I think Napa she was a cab, yeah, was a really good cab. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the one that. That's, uh, the, one. that's the one. Save but it. I'm not opening that now. No, don't open that yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. Honestly, that's uh, that's become a it's become a collector's wine just because, like I say, it was the cover child for the. Uh, Thank you for telling me that now. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, I promise you, uh, get it, uh, I'll get you some more. If you need. <laughs> but that wine is officially so sold out. Uh, when we didn't even get news of the decanter cover story uh, until after Chris and I noticed that we thought there was, there was kind of a run on the wine on our website. We only made 100 cases of it. And I looked and I thought, why did why did thirty cases of that wine sell yesterday? What happened? And then and then apparently somebody had leaked the story, and uh, and then um, we were able to get it off the website in time so that not every single bottle was gone. But we're we're hoarding a handful of cases for for you know for our club members and and for special occasions and things like that. We're kind of toying with the idea now of releasing a a vertical of the 14, 15, and 16 Napa Valley cab so that people will have a chance to not only taste them off, but uh, again, just for club members and uh, just for alpha and back people uh, so that they can also get uh, a little bit more of that wine if they want. But uh, yeah, they, um, they featured it uh, on a local television show that we just taped last week. And uh, it, it cracks me up. We're, we're, we're overnight successes after 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at this as being a special occasion. So it, it worked out very well. Okay. That's good. Absolutely. Bob, Bob sommelier once told me you always start with the best. Because after the first bottle, nobody remembers it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good advice, actually. That works at dinner parties, too. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's good. So I know we have some fisher people here who I remember stories of <laughs> someone's fishing and someone's accompanying the fisherman and drinking a bottle of Pinot at the same time. <laughs> Why would that? Oh, you are. <laughs> yeah, we've been known to uh, kayak with a bottle on the front of the kayak. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Best. <laughs> wow. 
So Randy, you mentioned earlier about the, the possibility of still doing a Merlot uh, in an upcoming vintage. Is that a, a uh, will that happen with, if you have the right amount of uh, product? Because you said you blend Merlot in, in, in other wines. So are you gonna cut off a piece of that and keep it and make it straight Merlot? That's a good question. The, uh, it really depends on the final blend. We, uh, because the fire not only destroyed the cab crop in 2017, but about 30% of the cab vines, um, the only block that was largely untouched by the fire is where the Merlot is. Uh, even though we're back in cab production, the, we're not getting as much cab. And so um, in theory, if we stay to our usual recipe, blending recipes, I mean, we were usually about six to eight percent Merlot uh, in our Atlas B cab. We will have Merlot left over again, maybe. And uh, but it all depends on how it turns out when we blend. Uh, if we have enough to s separately make a Merlot again, we'll do it. I ironically, one of the most uh, uh, the tricky, one of the trickiest parts is that, as you know, all of our wines have screened labels. Uh, and that's a much more arduous, expensive, and time-consuming process where you have to plan further ahead. If you, uh, if we were just slapping paper labels on the wines, we, we could make a decision two days before bottling. But, uh, but because we have to plan ahead and, uh, and get the, all of the screens ready and the paints and all of that stuff, uh, we're going to have to make a decision sooner rather than later about whether we're going to use, whether we're going to do another below. Another, another conversation that the winemaker just started, I'd be curious to get maybe other people's reactions, but she's also suggesting that maybe instead we uh, uh, put together a kind of a, uh, just kind of a combination wine uh, with, we also will have some Petit Verdot left over, maybe some Petit Verdot, some Merlot. We might have a little bit of cab from down on the valley floor. And uh, uh, just, uh, it would be a second label for us. It would be a, a less expensive wine, a red blend that really just depends on kind of what we have that we're not using elsewhere. Uh, it's still, and we're actually gonna taste the first version of that tomorrow and see whether that would be worth doing. We've been having a lively conversation about what the hell to call it. Um, the right So far at the moment anyway, Chris has the front runner idea. She suggested we call it beta blend. Uh, I'll let you explain it, sweetie. Well, the, I have to stick with the, what I research with wolves, so I'm, otherwise Ryan will hold my feet to the fire about that, but um, being honest about it, but, um, in a wolf pack, of course, alpha is the leader, but the second in line, if something were to happen to the alpha, is the beta. And But we're still discussing that because we're sort of tossing around the idea, of if you call it a beta blend and you explain that it's the second uh, leader in the pack, that maybe people will think it's not as good, mm. as, you know, which is not true when we taste it. So. Anyway, we'll, we'll get the family going on this. They've been pretty funny about coming up with ideas. I wanted to say hi to Jayla. She just joined us. She's on her cell phone, actually. I love it. Hey, Jayla. Hi, how are, hi, how are you? I'm actually from Chorology Vines, but for some reason it went through my other email, but it's okay. That's I'm sipping right. on the rosé. <laughs> oh, you're sipping on the rosé. Good. Yes, yes, yes. Last time I joined your tasting, I was not able to have any of the wines and then after that i was able to order this and it was fantastic i'm just enjoying it so well, i'm much. glad that it got to you in time enjoy i hope yes, the yes. is where you are so you can really enjoy it yes well it's still a little crispy in new york so it's still kind of cold but it's like a fight but hopefully it'll get warmer and i can really enjoy it Good. this weekend hopefully well we're glad you joined us thank you so, so if any of you have any inspirations for names yeah. other than beta blend I was I was thinking hodgepodge really sounded glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Randy was like when we were deciding what to name kids, and Randy goes, "I've got the perfect boy's name, Timber, Timberwolf." I still think it's good. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so see see what your mom protected you from, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. 
I told her nobody would even know except at graduation. Yeah. Just go by Tim. I was always partial to never cry. I don't know why you didn't consider never cry. There we go. And I know there's a whole contingent of young people in our family who uh, are big were big Game of Thrones fans. So they would they would like to see a dire wolf at some point, but I think that's probably a trademark part. It so, might be, but it sounds like a good idea. I'm a Game of Thrones fan, so that sounds great. <laughs> somebody else suggested that you just call it whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> That's a real Chris? selling point. <laughs> Chris? Yep. How about Big Bad? Big Bad. Big Bad Wolf. Bad. <laughs> this, is, bad Lobo. This, is, this is one of the best parts of it, is, yeah. is drinking and coming up with names. Well, Pam was yeah, the big bad boy. When we made Howl, yeah. big bad we were boy. releasing Howl. She's the one who said you should release it on Halloween. <laughs> Thought that was pretty clever. So and we then you could have it be a red, and then put like a little red riding hood or something. Somewhere. <laughs> big bad wolf and little red. The little yeah, there you go. Hey, hey Chris. Yeah, I have a an idea um call it alpha pup as in puppy uh-huh alpha Ooh. pup i don't know just an idea yeah you know somebody else had suggested cub do they call wolf are they, are they wolf pups or wolf cubs i think they're cubs but, I think they're but, cubs. Yeah. but the same concept anyway somebody else suggested that also i like that idea of something uh, uh, kind of uh, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not the uh, best source. I still remember when we were planted our first vineyard and it was in a horse corral. And so I wanted to call the wine Chateau Horseship. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another idea that didn't fly. <laughs> so that's right in there with Timberwolf. <laughs> well, I think you mentioned on one other one of the other calls that one of your first ideas was to call the, the use the Italian word for wolf, which is lupa. And I said, nobody wants to drink something that sounds like a disease. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that didn't fly. So, and probably Lobo is not actually totally correct in Spanish, but um, it, I mean, it does mean wolf in Spanish, but I think yeah. how you conjugate it probably is not, it's not correct just calling it Lobo. Either El Lobo or you know, something like that, or Los Lobo. Yeah, yeah uh, I speak Spanish, but Lobo is correct. I think uh, only when you're going to refer to a certain wolf, then maybe you could say Los or El Lobo. But it's, I think it's good. Um, I like the idea of Red Riding Hood. Um, I don't know if you are into like maybe make, finding an art or something or a picture of maybe a Riding Hood and a wolf. That might be something maybe, and then release it in October time frame. Yeah, I don't know if that it, maybe it could just be a label. It, it may not even have to be a name name. Yeah, it's and it may you know, if it's a second label for us, Randy. It doesn't necessarily have to be screened. You know, it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. We we might be able to do that and do a paper label that would be consistent with a second label. Yeah, might Our, even make it a series because your blend may be different every year depending on what you have. So if it's going to be different, kind of like just making it a. Uh, not a not a generic label, but a label that has the characters that everybody's described because it could, it could vary from year to year and it doesn't tie you to any specific combination. So if it was if it was a uh, little red riding hood's favorite wolf, uh, next year it could be Los Lobos or something else. Because right, it's just right. the, it's the, the ability to use your your remaining juice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a timely question because, like I say, we're tasting yeah. it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it'll be fun to taste it tomorrow with Victoria. So, um, and see, she usually has some good ideas too. But our family can get pretty funny. I think when we were trying to figure out what we were going to call the rosé, they had oh God. really funny names for it. Yeah, <laughs> no way, rosé. You, know. <laughs> you know, you That's just a paper little, label. Yeah. <laughs> But a paper label with the art, that's a great idea because our second son is actually the artist who designed our labels. So, oh, nice. So he's a graphic artist, so he might have a lot of fun 
doing Ooh. another kind of artistic label. So it might be a really fun thing for him to do. Especially after a bottle of the 15 Napa Cab, his creativity might just explode. Yep. <laughs> he's really, unfortunately, not a big wine drinker. So, but he's, he's learning to like it. And uh, so. Yeah, and, he's out of beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's well, Oregon will never run out of beer. <laughs> oh, actually, that's working on. <laughs> that's for sure, Pam. Huh? That's for sure. Yeah. Oh my God. So I, I got asked an interesting question. I thought it was an interesting question anyway. Um, I'd be curious how other people would respond. Somebody asked me um, if you weren't able to pick and you could only pick one. What part of the wine business would you want to be in? Would you rather be a farmer? Or would you rather be a winemaker? Or would you rather be something else? Uh, now you can't you, you can't say, oh, I want to uh, I want to own Opus One. That that doesn't that doesn't work. We all want that one. Here's my vote. Yeah, a drinker. Could be the drinker. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, quality control. <laughs> that was what I call quality it. Quality control. Absolutely. Yep. Some, and some people said hospitality. They said, you know, that's what I'd like the most. I like, uh, you know, I like selling the wine, but also just interacting with people and stuff like that. Yeah, our whole concepts of all those things may change. I think the hardest one is winemaker because you don't realize how much is involved yeah. in winemaking and, all, you know, all the background and the chemi chemistry and the, the uh, chemistry of vines and the chemistry of a leaf of a vine. It's very, very interesting, but you, you really have to have a lot of knowledge. That's why I prefer the other end of the spectrum where I'm just the quality control. The quality control is finished. <laughs> I can tell right you. now you could be a curbside distributor. Yes. Which would not be. <laughs> well, they have them. The, the local wine stores in Sacramento are just curbside at the moment. Yeah, yeah this, it's a it's a distributor's world right now too. I mean, a lot of them are combining into larger entities, and and it's a buyer's market for them. You know, so many wineries queued up, and they've been kind of picking choose who they like the best. A lot of our restaurants are doing curbside takeout of wine and takeout of cocktails. Too, so. yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Well, for me, I, I like, somebody uh, told me once and it stuck with me, that the most important thing you can put on your vineyard is your roots. And uh, so I really try to spend time in the vineyards and I really enjoy the farming part of the process a lot, a lot more than I thought I would. Um, the winemaking is so... Yep, we're losing you because of the wind. Uh, anyway, so, and for me, it would be some combination of those two. I, I can tell you what I don't want to do is what Chris does, which is manage all of the licenses in all the states. And say, oh my God, I paid this prospective sales taxes. And, oh, you know, it, it would be so much easier to sell opium than to sell alcohol. It's, it is so complicated. So much paper comes out of her printer. Well, that's true. Stick to the wine business, please. Yeah, yeah. regulatory oh, yeah, okay. stuff is really difficult. And I know that wineries have all, well, there's a whole wine institute and trying to work to get this to be, well, they call it free the grapes. And they want the wine industry to be uniform across the entire country instead of state by state by state, where they have different licensing. I don't mind that they want you to have a license. The state has to make some money too, but um but they're just, some of the restrictions are really onerous. I mean, we have some states, customers that we ship to, that by the end of the year or toward October, we have to tell them we can't ship anymore to them because they've exceeded their personal limit for the year because the state has a limit on how many cases of wine an individual can get from out of state. Really? So um, there's What's a lot of things. What, which state is that? I, you know, right off the top of my head, I don't know, but oh. some of them, I think Louisiana is one. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, of course, are states like Utah that don't allow you to ship wine into them. I think Alabama is another one. Hey, Pam, um, you're a... Oklahoma. You're, Oklahoma, Pam, yeah. Pam's a big time farmer. What, uh, how many acres of cherries do you have? Uh, 
I, I think we have about 40,000 trees. Oh, and, uh, we had, and we now have about 10 acres of pears. We also have wheat in this little town in Oregon called Dufer, Oregon. So back to your question, Randy, I think I picked the farming part. Yeah, I was just going to There's ask something you. about that. But we have a total of about 900 acres, I guess. But it's not all farmed. Well, Randy's early farming experiences, though, were pretty funny from our very first acre and a half when he was out there every day with the vineyard workers and he was the only one without a hat in the sun. Uh-oh. Yeah, and the rest of them had their hats on and they're sort of looking at him like, oh, we got another gringo here. It's <laughs> going to a restaurant was a good Spanish restaurant and they look at you like, oh, we're gonna give them the hot sauce because they don't even know what they're eating, so. It was honestly, it was pathetic, is what it was. <laughs> I didn't want to use the term. The, uh, you know, well, the first thing I noticed was that they didn't necessarily need a hat because they were constantly working in the shade, whereas I wasn't oh. able to figure that out. Then oh. I realized that they were wearing gloves after, you know, that, that trellis wire cuts your hands after a while. But, uh, but the most humiliating part, I have to confess, was is during harvest. Because you know, I'd go out and I'd want to harvest with these guys, and uh, and it's no small effort to get up at four in the morning and get out there with your miner's hat and do all that stuff. And it's it is not an exaggeration to say that they would pick, I'm going to say seven to eight vines in the time it took me to do one. Like I said, it was clear that whatever my true calling is, that wasn't it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually become in the valley they do every year a pruning contest yeah. from all these vineyard managers and they just in the last two years they actually did a separate category for the women who are vineyard workers and who actually do the pruning as well so they have a, a separate category for them as well and have winners in that category so it's nice to see they're opening it up a little um when, i don't know if we have any of you have seen harvest but when they harvest they have these big they look like big laundry baskets and like I say, you literally get out there when it's pitch black because you want the fruit to get to the winery uh, before it gets warm enough that bacteria will grow on the fruit. And uh, they have they have these little hand held, they look like mini scythes, just kind of a little hook with a real sharp edge on the inside of the loop. And they, they have the, the uh, laundry basket, if you will, at their feet. And then they're just going like this, knocking clusters off so that they fall right into the laundry basket. They kick the laundry basket up the row as they slide up the row, and and it it's just it's amazing to watch how fast they take they can take the fruit off the vines. Yeah, I, think there's, I don't think there's anywhere in the valley that's automated. I know we saw some automated pickers in France when we were there, but um, I don't think that's actually caught on in the valley. And for us, most of our vines are what they call close row planted. There's only about three and a half feet, is that right, Randy, four feet? You yeah, can't generally. get a tractor down them to do any work, so everything has to be done by hand. It's labor intensive entirely. And on the vineyard that's right behind Randy, that's actually down a slope, uh, at least more than a 15 degree slope, and we just put in some rows on the side, took out some rows so that the workers would be able to get back up on the side rather than coming up the rows because it's really treacherous. So, um, Chris, it's the same with cherries. It all has to be hand done. There's yeah. no machinery. It's, it's hand done. Yeah. Yeah. And precise, like yours. They pick, they, how do they pick them? Do they shake the trees? <laughs> no, they have, they have to take them, they have to pick them at a certain uh, part of the, of the tree so that it doesn't impair, see they're thinking about next year's crop. So where the, where the cherry is selected, um, they have to think of the future. So you have to, you have to do it a certain way. And I, you know, I, I wish I were more descriptive about how that's done, but like, like your crop, it, it has to be hand done. Yeah. yeah, well, the hardest part for us when we were first learning was that we didn't real. I didn't realize that you have to, in order for to make it 
a better crop, you have to drop some of the vines. And so the first year that they were doing that, I was literally out there running after them with my basket, like a vegetable basket from the market, picking up all the, what I call my babies off the ground because they were just dropping fruit. And that was in order to make the rest of the vines more productive and taste better. And I didn't realize that. I just thought, oh my gosh, they're killing off my babies. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I thought there goes another case. There goes another case. <laughs> oh. But it really does make a difference. And so there's a whole art to that, to pruning them. Just like I think Victoria was talking last week about suckering. This is about the time when you sucker the vines. And that's actually taking, well, Randy's probably a better descript, describer of this, but they're taking off the shoots from the bottoms of, the, of each vine that would be drawing energy from the fruit that's going to right. come out on the top. So they do pull these things off uh, so that they're not getting any of the energy. They're not getting the, the water and they're not getting the sunlight. They're actually pushing it up to, to the fruit that you want yeah. to get that. So that's, that's kind of what they're doing now. So that's another part of the farming that has to be done by hand and very precisely. Hey, Chris. I'm going to uh, bid everyone a, a uh, goodbye. Hopefully okay, see bye. everyone next week. And once again, thank you for putting this together. And hopefully, as I said, we'll see all one another next week. Bye -bye. Okay, enjoy bye. the rest of your wine tonight. I will. <laughs> what, what is the, uh, what's the program next week? Next week, we're doing an actual virtual tasting with the Chardonnay, the 2018 Chardonnay and the 2016 Howell. Those are our two cool. most recent um, wines that we okay. make. The Chardonnay, um, Victoria does not make for us. We, we custom crushed that at Lewis Cellars from Randy Lewis, who, who originally bought all of our Chardonnay. Uh, so Randy will be talking about that, but um, Victoria is the one who'll be talking about the Howell, which was a blend of Syrah and Cab that came from the valley floor. And Randy Lewis had just most all of the Syrah from us. And, but one year it didn't all ripen at the same time. So we said, we'll take what doesn't ripen and let it hang until the Cabernet right across the road ripened at the same time. And then we picked them both at the same time. And we just, and Victoria said, well, now what are we gonna do with it? And we said, well, let's blend it and see what it tastes like. And so we've been doing that since 2014. Is that right, Randy? Yeah, it, it actually tastes pretty good. I'm yeah, drinking it right now. Very good, yeah. I'm drinking it right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks like there's not much left. No, we're so it, half a bottle. <laughs> so if I order it tonight, I would probably be have, I'll have it in time by next week then for the tasting. Yes, you would. Perfect, perfect, you okay. <laughs> if, you go, if you go on the website, Jayla, you can, um, it's listed on, I think it, it'll go right for, if you got our email, the recent email, it goes mm -hmm. right on into the wine store at the top where it says shop our wines. And the very first page, you'll see virtual tasting kit. Mm -hmm. And it's three wines, because we're going to do two next week and then one the next week after that. But the whole package of the three wines is 25% off and complimentary shipping. So you get it before you're tasting next week. 